Hello folks and welcome to the beautifully spooky Hammond Castle in Magnolia for a special Halloween edition of Now We're Here. I'm your host, Corey Kuru, along with my co-host, Maureen Aylward. Thanks, Corey. It's great to be here at the beautiful Hammond Castle, spooky Hammond Castle. I grew up right down the street, so this is extra special for me to be a part of this today. Right. So uh, we have to thank the castle right off the bat for just allowing yes. us to use this space for yeah. Now We're Here. So hopefully it's, uh, it's uh, the start of a really long and beautiful relationship with the castle. Um, they have lots of exciting things going on here now. They've had a banner mm -hmm. year, so uh, I can't wait to get started. Yeah, we're gonna hear a lot about uh, the castle in just a little bit, but um, we thought we'd talk about the the origins of Halloween, since this is our special Halloween show, mm -hmm. for a little bit. Um, so <clears throat> Halloween actually has Celtic origins. I don't know if you if you knew that. I didn't know this until you, you brought it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a pagan holiday. Um, you know, the, lots of things about witches nowadays. Apparently, this is the season of a witch this year. There's a lot of witch witchy books coming out. Mm -hmm. um, but it does have uh, Celtic origins because it's festival time. So. Um, during that time, you know, they would build huge bonfires, they would have feasts, uh, but in the Celtic tradition of Halloween, also the Wiccan tradition or the pagan tradition, it's also called Samhain. And um, that's <clears throat> spelled S-A-M-H-A-I-N, also known as Samhain's Eve. But again, it's a time when spirits were celebrated, ancestors were celebrated, where they were thought to come through the villages and walk through the villages. And so over the years, this traditional harvest fast have harvest festival was um, changed. And uh, as the Christian traditions came in, they adopted this, but they were afraid of the spirits. They were afraid of ancestors coming down. Mm -hmm. And the little wee folk, and by wee folk, we mean fairies and elves and other little elementals. I'm five, six and redheaded. I will not take that personally. You, I it's won't. Totally, it was a total dig. <laughs> um, but uh, so in the other traditions, which is again, like these, these traditions that we still celebrate today, pumpkin carvings, jack-o'-lanterns, and the old Celtic traditions, it was a turnip that was carved as a lantern and then mm -hmm. they would carry it. And so to um, you know, push away spirits, they would dress in straw or they would dress in sheets of white, sound familiar? Um, or they would actually have scary masks on uh, as the tradition continued. So I just wanted to mention the Celtic origins. Yeah, it's really you know, wild. Being a, of Celtic origin, Yes, awesome. Um, and it, so it's just something to think about these days, the apples, the fests, the bonfires, the jack-o'-lanterns, the black cats, these things were all carried back um, and forward. Yeah, so. how it all came to be. Yeah. So what's great is, of course, we have the, the Halls of Darkness, the Haunted Museum tours that the castle is doing right now uh, for the holiday. Uh, but we're also, we have to talk about the man himself, John Hayes Hammond Jr. Yes. And how this all came to be yeah. as well. It's a fascinating uh, venue if you've never been here before at 80 Hesper Sav in Magnolia. So to join us right off the bat is the curator of Hammond Castle Museum, Mr. Scott Cordner. How are you, Scott? I'm doing well. Hi, Scott. Thank you Welcome. So much for Lovely to, yeah, thanks so for nice some to meet time you. With us. Wonderful to meet you as well. And congratulations on your new role here. Yeah, yeah so curator and creative director, mm -hmm. so very much my job is to put together new exhibits, keep changing them so rather than people coming once every 30 years, they will come back maybe once every two or three years, um, but also to be the creative director of the museum. So very much my job is how am I going to present this entire thing to the people so that they can understand what Hammond was um, to Gloucester, but also to our country? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So why don't, right off the top, tell us a little bit about Hammond the man. Okay, so John A. Hammond Jr. was born 1888, dies 1965. When he dies in 65, he was our sixth most prolific inventor. He had 436 patents, wow. but very diverse. He was called uh, the father of radio control, so like what we have with drones today. This traces right back to Hammond, but also um, a lot of commercial goods like a magnetic bottle cap opener, um, different things for radio, inventions for the piano, for the pipe organ, you know, very diverse in his interests. And also we're now able to start, start to present how his interests change over time, over the 70 years is that he was an inventor. Right, and we find out that in his youth, he befriends Thomas Edison. He befriends <laughs> Alexander Graham Bell. Well, they bef befriend him, yes. Um, first, he's introduced um, to Thomas Edison when he was about oh, 12 years old. 
John A's Hammond Jr.'s father was the most prominent, prominent mining engineer in the entire world. And Edison was, um, he was coming up with a new way to extract ore. And so naturally he calls the biggest name in the business. Well, John A's Hammond Jr. told him, he says, you know what, my son Jack, he was always called Jack, you know, he's very much interested in being an inventor. Can I bring him along? And he did. And Edison was taken to immediately because here's this young child asking such very poignant questions. But also, of course, Alexander Graham Bell very much became his mentor. Mm. That's so, extraordinary. It's extraordinary. And here we are in his extraordinary home. So this, he built, he builds this between 1926 and 1929. Um, he fell in love with castles when, as a young child, he was in England. But his idea behind all of this was he said in 1924, before he even begins construction, that, you know, I'm not going to be remembered for my inventions. There's going to be other inventions that will supersede mine. He goes, this modest museum on the coast of Gloucester, this will be my legacy. So he very much wanted um, the children of Gloucester to see, you know, very old architecture, medieval architecture, but also to see medieval artifacts. So that was his reasoning for building this museum. And, and as far as architecture goes, you sort of, did he piecemeal the museum together? So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a bit eclectic. Mm. You know, remember, he wants to show the children of Gloucester very different styles. So we have a 13th century um, Gothic castle. We have a 13th century Gothic cathedral, which is this section. Mm -hmm. And finally in the back is the residential area, which is 15th century French rural chateau-esque. So it's like, it's, it's very eclectic, but you can really see how the European architecture changes and, you know, meets different purposes. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, Hammond was an eclectic guy. He was very eclectic, very, very diverse interests, be it music, be it art, be it, of course, um, in engineering, radio, also mm -hmm. in inventions for the television. Um, so very, very uh, interesting character is the way I like to put it. So, Scott, as curator, what are some of the projects that you're working on right now that we could tell our viewers about? So next year, for the first time, we are really going to focus on how this museum, this castle, evolved. I mean, we think of it, oh, it's done, but it wasn't. He was making modifications throughout his entire life. And we have original sketches, and I can show one right here. You can show it to yeah, us. Right Scott there, okay. This before. These are amazing. So he did this sketch here? No, this sketch was done for him by Allen and Collins. They're a, um, a uh, architectural firm in Boston that actually designed the cloister in New York. But this changed over time, so we have hundreds of blueprints, dozens of sketches, um, correspondence going back and forth of how this was a living castle and changing and the changes that he made. Um, but also, I'm also an educator, so he was a very prolific inventor, father of radio control, so we also need to focus on the inventing aspect. And because education right now is so much focused towards STEM, sure. science, technology, engineering, and math, this is the perfect place for that because here we can put in the hands of students the original mm -hmm. patents, the original patent documents so that they can see what that patent process is. I just yeah, think that's amazing. so exciting to have that right here in Gloucester and Cape Ann. I mean, it's, is it something we take for granted because we, we know about it and we know that it's here, but the history of it is just so fascinating. I was here as a child. We would always come here and um, it's, I think it's just so exciting that you're and doing it, this. It really does very much offer for all age groups. And, you know, young children really mo much want to see, um, like the medieval armor, which we do some things yeah. with that. But, of course, also patents, but also adults. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to see, you know, this place. They want to be able to bring their kids here. But also to see, you know, what is more? What You know, I know about Hammond. I know about, you know, some of the creepy things about it. But really, I want to know more about him as an inventor. I want to know more of what I'm seeing here. When I was going to ask, like, what, you seem so enthusiastic about being here now. What, I mean, what is it about you that has you so excited about uh, learning this history or being a part of it now? Well, I mean, like you, I came here for the first time in first grade on a field trip. Mm -hmm. And actually, my wife, we were very good friends as seven-year-olds. We came here together. And when I had found out I had the opportunity to come here to be a tour guide and learn about this, but also to refine the tours so that they could really properly present it. I mean, what is not to love about this building, but also everything about it 
Um, all the structure, all the history, all the inventions, all the technical aspects that you know you can really present to people, and of course you know the organ, which people are very much interested in right. as well. Um, we actually, for the very first time, we have an accurate count of how many pipes are in the pipe organ. We have, I had a staff member and an intrepid um, uh, intern from uh, Ipswich High School, Cecilia. Um, and that person who was also tasked was me. So I can say, officially, there are 7,400 pipes to the pipe organ in mm -hmm. five galleries. Wow. So there's so much to learn. Here. I know, there's and, so much. And the hope is to restore the organ. Eventually to restore that's, that's it so it will be playable. There's a lot of things, you know, structural things we do have to take care of mm -hmm. first. But yes, that is very much, you know, that's, that's I know, the, the the, the big thing at the end of the, the, the golden road, let's say. Right. Yeah, there's so much happening at the castle. Yeah, there really and, is. And more to come. Absolutely. We're super right. excited about it. And I also want to point out that Scott and I have talked um, in the past about the secret passageway from to the wine cellar. To the wine oh, cellar. Yes. I want to do some sort of Al Capone's vault <laughs> so, thing with you sometime. <laughs> for the of course first, you do. For of the first time do. ever, next year, we're going to have a piece of plexiglass so you will be able to see that secret door, where it leads to, wow. and what's behind Very it. Yeah, cool. I, mean, I mean, every castle has to have a secret door, of course, a secret yeah, of passageway. Oh, Scott, we're so, we so appreciative of you spending Absolutely. time with us today. We yes. cannot wait to keep working with you in the future on a lot Absolutely. of different projects yeah. and learn all about, well, more about you as well as him <laughs> and the castle. <laughs> in this place of in course. history and uh, and thanks so much for being here. Absolutely. It's been an absolute pleasure. All right, we'll talk to you soon. Absolutely. And if people want to learn more thanks, about the Scott. castle, how can they do that, Scott? Well, I mean, we're, we're getting more and stuff online, but really, um, you know, I would say come here. Yeah. Come here, take one of the guided tours, but we also have additional tours that we are adding. Um, uh, Early, uh, late 19th, 20, 19th century and 20th century spiritualism movement. Mm -hmm. um, we're we're going to continue great. to add new tours so that the very many mm -hmm. aspects of him can finally be revealed. And also in the summertime is a special time to come. I know that we're heading into fall and yep. winter, but you have a candlelight tours yes, we in the have, summertime? Yes, we have candlelit tours every Thursday, and that's also when we do. We interleave also a spiritualism tour there. So, yes, the entire castle, it has, it's lit by candlelight and by me by a flashlight watching <laughs> out for the, uh, the bats flying by yeah. but um, yeah. really you know it's, it's a way to see the castle in very much haha a different light yes <laughs> thanks for being awesome. on right, thank Scott, you, Scott it's been Gordon. a pleasure thank you very much yeah we'll look forward Curator to having you on again creative director here at Hammond Castle right. Museum that's right thanks Scott awesome so our next guest is Linda Harvey the executive director of uh, the Hammond Castle and Museum L Linda come on up yeah and Linda can speak more of course to some of the programming <laughs> that we have going on here now and yeah. it seems hi, hi Linda thanks for joining us thank you, thank you so much for being on here. that we loved having your presence here at the castle it's oh wonderful. thank you it yeah. seems as if the castle is going through this really cool transitional period it now is. And so how, in your mind, are, are things changing? And how do you, in what direction do you want to see the castle move in, in the future? Well, um, actually, I was hired about a year ago mm -hmm. and to be the executive director. And we haven't had one at the castle for quite a few years. So I was sort of handed this blanket slate that I can go anywhere, do anything I want, and within reason, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but just to create new programming and to build the enthusiasm um, and coming to the castle and just seeing all that we have to offer. Mm -hmm. um, we're doing a lot of publicity and things that we hopefully will draw more people from further direction from uh, reaching out into the, further into the community, into the state, into the country, and our, of course mm -hmm. our European visitors as well. Right. Mm -hmm. So how is your love for the castle? When and how did that begin and, and, <laughs> and how did it manifest? Actually it began many, many years ago, um, just coming here and visiting and being a volunteer at, at certain times. Mm -hmm. um, and then I went off and did lots of things, raising my children and having fun and, and raising money for nonprofit organizations across um, Essex uh, County uh, on a number of boards and uh, finally when the castle approached me I seemed to have all the qualifications that I needed to take the position. It's funny so how those things come up in your life right? The right job at the right time Absolutely. in the right place? Perfect. That's, that's great. absolutely perfect. So what's coming up or what's uh, what are you thinking about new programs for the castle? Well, 
we started a couple of things this past summer. For one, we opened seven days a week as opposed to having the castle open six. Right. Yeah. Um, that extra Monday when some other um, organizations in the area are not open, um, it gives people a place to come and places to enjoy, mm -hmm. something that to, uh, to spend time in and to relax and enjoy not only the castle itself, but the grounds, the beautiful grounds, wonderful perennial gardens, and, uh, and of course, our ocean view. So we started a bunch of new programming, um, one of which was Bubbles and Books, which is a program where you can bring your children um, on Monday mornings and have a story read in the castle. Can you think of anything that could be better than to be read a story in Hammond Castle? Right. I can't. Really cool. right. I mean, when you're so, a child, this place is so magical. It is magical. It is yeah. magical. And it's a wonderful thing that you're just opening up and having these different programs. It is. So yeah. then we take the children out to the back so they have a little fresh air. We do bubbles on the lawn and give them mm -hmm. a snack and have a wonderful morning for them. So it seems like there's just a, a very conscious effort to make the, the castle more accessible exactly. to everybody. Mm -hmm. right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. We've had a wonderful exhibit by a robotics club um, mm -hmm. from the Ipswich high school came here and of course that ties in with the radio control of Hammond and Hammond actually created his own robot which was a dog um, and many many years ago so we brought the dog out to for the team to show their their robots and to run them around the halls and it was a great attraction people loved coming and seeing it and being part of the history as well as the, the presence i think we'd so. like to see that dog sometime on the show i'm all for it yeah. <laughs> anything anything that he's shows really, off by hammer's cool. prowess as well because i yeah i think he was uh, he, he had a long-standing contract with rca and work with yes, them and did. most of his inventions were, th were through RCA mm -hmm. so uh, I mean it's just it's unlimited you walk through the castle and there are so many different facets and amazing nooks mm -hmm. and crannies where they tell a story um, so that's what's been great here just being able to, to, yeah. to spend time with you and revisit mm -hmm. and there are so many stories to tell of course there are yeah and actually we're um, improving our signage on some of those things so that people are better aware of what we have here mm -hmm. and can have that experience um, and also too we've been doing some specializing and doing an arms and armor program um, having our past uh, period uh, John Pettibone mm -hmm. has come and um, he's an expert in arms and armor and so this is a wonderful attraction for people to come in actually try on the armor itself and you know get all decked out and uh, touch it and just have that general feeling of what it's all about mm -hmm. so um, those are great and exciting programs they, come up. they truly are yeah. yeah do you see so I think w my question is where do you want to see the castle in 2000 you know 2020 2021 what, like is there a big um, you know what, what is the light at the end of the tunnel for you where it's like oh okay this is a whole yeah. new experience <laughs> it's for a people. real renaissance it for is, the castle it really. is a new renaissance yeah. for the castle and I think um, just having more and more people come um, our visitations were up up by 40% this past summer. Yeah, so it was, was it one of the, it was a great year for it the castle? It was a fabulous overall? season mm -hmm. for the castle. And just having the availability of being open longer as well. We're going to be starting our calendar earlier this spring, um, hopefully in April. And then um, we continue it, it this year through the month of September. Um, so we have closed down the last day of September so that we could put our halls of darkness together. And we're going to learn so. more about that shortly. <laughs> you are, definitely. <laughs> and so. and another thing I want to ask too is, you have made some pretty amazing discoveries here as well. Yes. Would our, you like to share some of those with us? Our Fontuni collection. Right. Uh, yes, I, right. Uh, Tell us about that. Um, it, was, it, was, it was a wonderful find. And actually, we're finding things all the time here um, that have been noted that they are in the castle but haven't been displayed or uh, focused on. And Mario Fontuni is a designer, dress designer, and um, he was making gowns and dresses for prominent women in the United States as well as Europe. He's based out of um, Italy, mm -hmm. Florence, and he uh, made two dresses that we uncovered that for Mrs. Hammond, and we've had put them on display for an exhibit on uh, the end of September for three weeks. And we're going to be bringing those back out again once a year for a special occasion. Um, but they were a wonderful find and uh, they're absolutely exquisite. They couldn't be more beautiful. So we love sharing that as it's well. It's an amazing story. And you're working yeah. in, in, in with the Fortuny uh, Museum in Milan, yes. right? 
Yes. How is that yeah. cooperation? It's been wonderful. We've had correspondence with them numerous. Actually, I have a feeling that they're probably going to send one of their representatives over to see the dresses right. because they're one of them in particular is very unique and very different. And um, of course, we had it. Uh, examined by them to make sure that it was a, a true Fortuny mm -hmm. um, and it met all of that, um, those qualifications. And That sounds like so, a special event. Oh, it is. Or a some kind of event. a, you know, yes. talk or something yeah. that people could come to. It sounds like a great thing. It was a wonderful evening yeah. that we had a presentation. Um, right. uh, one of our archivists gave a presentation on it one evening and uh, mm -hmm. it was enlightening. So, um, and something else I just want to touch a little bit on, mm -hmm. a new exhibit that will be opening in the spring. Um, Eric Pape, which is a local artist, um, did a lot of painting with the Hammonds. He painted Natalie Hammond quite a few times. Um, he was a good family friend as well. And he painted a mural, which is downstairs in our room, which we are presently calling the war room, but it really was a study. Um, and it's a mural that's on that wall, and we have a benefactor who's come in and is, is helping us restore that mural. So we're gonna have a huge celebration unveiling the um, new mural um, and actually new exhibits um, that Scott's putting together, help put together the for, for that, that room. Yet? We don't, but I will be sure that we get that information out on our website, um, a great place to look to see what's coming to the castle mm -hmm. as well. Very that's cool wonderful. News. And the hope too is that we can come back sometime in the spring yeah. and do another one of these shows, but make it an event and have a public event, have them be allowed. Because when we posted, when we actually announced that we were going to be doing this, we had dozens of people who yeah. I think they were assumed that it was, people the parking lot might be full oh. right now. Yeah, they assumed this was a it. public event and they wanted to participate. So yeah. I think that's so a So we'd cool love thing to coordinate consider. with you on one of those. That would yeah. be great Definitely fun. Definitely do that. So Linda Harvey, Executive Director of the Human Coastal Museum, you're going to be joining us again a little later yes, on to I talk am. about yeah. some uh, yeah. uh, really uh, upcoming events, like the, the more, um, uh, the holiday themed stuff. I look forward to doing that. Okay, right. cool. Thanks. So thank Thanks, you. Linda. We'll Thanks. see you shortly. And if you're just tuning in, uh, welcome to Hammond Castle. We're doing a special uh, Halloween themed Now We're Here. Uh, we wanted to set the table and sort of talk about all the things going on here um, at Hammond Castle Museum. Uh, as it, they're in this really interesting transitional period where they have coming off a, a banner season. Right. And are finding um, a lot of amazing discoveries here as well and right. want to showcase more of the Hammond's inventions as well. So there's a lot going on. So. And so we know that this is a spooky time of year and yeah. people love Halloween so much. It's for kids and adults and the castle is having the special halls of darkness both tonight and also tomorrow night um, times are uh, what are the times I think I think tonight is uh, six o'clock at the uh, stage four park, park for the bus four park. it starts at 6 30 and then tomorrow night it's 5 30 to catch the bus over at stage four park because you can only get here by that bus and the halls of darkness starts at six the door is um, it, tickets are at the door for $15, but you can only um, get them at the door. And so to celebrate this Halls of Darkness, we have um, one of its participants and somebody from the crew. So we have with us Hannibal Lecter. Um, do I want to touch you? The good doctor, Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> I'm not really sure, Clarice, that no. you should touch me. Okay, but, I, but I did want to ask, are the lambs still silent? Oh. <laughs> it's gonna be. It's gonna be. A and lot. let me give you one of my business castle. cards. Okay. And here's one with my name. That my great aunt was Japanese, so I had my business yes, card she was. with my name in Japanese. This is a legitimate business card. Corey, I might just have to get up and go on the other no, side. No, you're of fine you. right there. Um, I would you also, stay where you are. We'd also like to um, welcome Shannon. Shannon Murphy, Murphy Thor Thornley, Thornley. Yes. yes. Thanks for joining us, Shannon. Thank you. And you're part of the crew that sets up everything here yeah. too. So right off the bat, do you want to mention uh, sort of the, the logistics of particulars for people who want to attend tonight and tomorrow? Um, well, the biggest thing is, like I said, the parking. Um, you have to park at stage for it. We do have a bus that comes down. So if you park here, you get asked to leave because the buses can't go down. Mm -hmm. um, the last ticket is sold at 1045. Um, and other than that, um, there is, I don't, depending on the weather, it can get chilly, so you want to dress warm. Yep. Um, sometimes the line can get long. We try not to make you wait more than 40 minutes, but we can't always guarantee that because it depends on how many people actually do decide to come and how many people are here. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, it's a lot of fun, so I'm really excited about it for tonight. You've done an amazing okay. job. It Thank looks you very great. It looks great in here. Thank you. Yeah, yeah we have you a can really see good the, team. everything behind us. So how did you get Hannibal Lecter to come and be part of this <laughs> Halls of Darkness? Well, 
He was actually friends with my mom because my mom did. What? My mom did volunteer <laughs> here, so that's how I started as well. Have you just been in the castle this whole time? You just popped up and you decided to like no, come I, out at this time of the year, or what? Basically, they started Halloween here in 1986, mm -hmm. and I did two years of Norman Bates, and then we went to about eight years of Bram Stoker's Dracula. Oh. And then I found Hannibal Lecter because it's the way he talks. Mm -hmm. and I have fun with that. And is, is that your favorite character to play? I think of all the characters I've played, but when I was on the PBS series Fetch, they needed a, a Dracula character for that show for the kids. And they also needed someone to do a distant dog bark. So my second cousin was the comedian Jonathan Winters. And I grew up with oh, him really? in Springfield, Ohio. Oh, and he taught great. me at the age of six to uh, <laughs> right. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> and I still can do the distant dog bark. That's amazing. And we should mention, yeah. this is John Pettibone, who is a yes. former curator. John here. Pettibone. The real me is over here. Yes, so. that's right. <laughs> so, so, John, you've seen the castle change in so many ways. And how has that been for you to see, not just the, the, the Halloween side of things, or the haunted castle, but... I love what they're doing here. Scott is doing an amazing job. Mm -hmm. Linda Harvey is doing a phenomenal job. It's just, it's the kind of thing that Hammond would be so happy about because he wanted the place to be seen and he wanted the place to be enjoyed. And you really get that sense in here. Mm -hmm. So tell me, how spooky is the Halls of Darkness? It, it, it's spooky, It's pretty right? spooky. Um, one of the main things that I always tell people is you never get to see the dungeon. Um, during museum hours. That can always change, but that's kind of a Halloween special that you get to go down there oh. and see all the dungeons and get to see everyone in there. So there really is a dungeon. Yeah, there is. And we want to that's know that this fun. isn't for the little tykes either. Yeah, right. I it's think PG it could be 13. a little too much I think you definitely them. want yeah. to keep in mind that it can be PG-13. You don't want, I mean, if I was five years old, I wouldn't, I'd be too scared. Yeah. That's how I see it. And how long does a tour last? The tours last about 15 to 20 minutes. Yeah, there's a lot we to see. We try to push it for 20 minutes at the most. But yeah. Sometimes it gets a little bit clustered just because there's so many people going through at the same time. And everybody's gone through okay? Has yeah. Dr. Lecter spooked anyone to the point where we had to make a, <laughs> a phone call or two? No, but we do have a few other people who make surprise appearances who come through as well. Is that so? so there's yeah. a couple. And I have my yeah. friend Michael Meyer that oh, shows up with his hockey now mask we're and his machete. <laughs> That's going to be great. And, you know. <laughs> But one of my great compliments was I was part of an online fan club. I actually found out that somewhere on Facebook about eight years ago there was a fan club and people come because they always want me to stand in a photo and smile. So I have a new smile. <laughs> <laughs> that works. <laughs> well, it's a real tradition, these, um, these, you know, the halls of darkness, is, you know, these other places where you have uh, spooky haunted things for mm -hmm. ha Halloween and it's been growing so so much and this has been going on for 33 years is well it was 86 so right. yeah. i'm not going to be year. the, mad the mathematician 33 years yeah. so this yeah. is a real one mm -hmm. that's been going on for a long mm -hmm. time yeah and, and I, I grew up right down the street, John, so we probably crossed paths in you these bet. halls <laughs> you a few times. Yeah. So you've been to them in the past. Oh, yeah. We used to line up when we were yeah. kids. We couldn't, yeah, we couldn't wait. Oh, yeah. The lines were horrendous. Mm -hmm. If you've got teenagers out there, this is going to be a great thing for the teenagers yeah, it's really to come. Absolutely. It's a real fun thing to come absolutely. in a group, too, right? I mean, there's nothing better than being scared sometimes. No, and you get popcorn right afterwards. Yeah, well, you that's get right. popcorn yeah. after you get scared. Out there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I should mention, Clary's, that we could ask Clary. Corey to join us for lunch. Oh my God, I'm gonna find, he's gonna be nibbling on my arm. We can have the the show fava beans and Keon. Well, you know what, Corey can have both of the cards. <laughs> and I hate to mention, but if you look at his left ear, Clarice, it's the perfect shape for a Ritz cracker. That's, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Everything you know goes better with the Ritz. We're speechless. We're, so do you actually speechless. banter back and forth with people coming through? Well, they think it's a set piece right. that I do, but I talk as I talk as Anthony <laughs> oh my gosh. Hopkins, and I have fun with that. Well, if you want to see uh, Dr. Hannibal Lecter uh, and in a person, lot of other wonderful volunteers, and yes. lots of other folks come to the Halls of Darkness again. It's tonight, and you have to and um, tomorrow night, and tomorrow night, and you have to catch the bus tonight at uh, six o'clock, and on Saturday at 5 30 but it's only Park, these two yeah. nights yes this is the last weekend yeah this is the last weekend unfortunately last last week when it was supposed to be on was the, um, the storm mm -hmm. the freakish the windstorm bombo the genesis. bombo genesis yeah, the, but the it is the last weekend until next year right mm -hmm. right so t you've got to catch it tonight 
um, so we, and tomorrow night. So welcome so much, yeah. and it was great to see you both. Thank you, yeah, Thank you very thanks much. Thanks for spending time with us. Shannon and um, John yeah. Pettibone. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for Dr. joining Neil us. Thank so you, much folks. fun. That um, was great. Okay. Can I just tell you I'm a little freaked out? Yeah, that was, but, the uh, Ritz cracked, I think, kind of threw me for a loop. But, uh, <laughs> we're not usually speechless on this show, but we were pretty silent yeah. being a... Uh, do you want to see someone spooked, really spooked out right now? Yeah. As cool. if we bring Mary Goldberg on Mary, the set. Mary, are you going <laughs> to? Back with Linda. No, Mary, you'll be going to be yeah. great. Because we just want to talk about some of the more immediate programming and events that we have going on at the castle. Hi, Mary. Yeah. How are you? So, so Mary Goldberg yes. and again, uh, the lovely Linda Harvey. Yeah. And, so, and Mary, you are doing marketing here? For marketing the, and communications. And you're a newbie. I am a newbie. Right? Since June. And we talked about this. Now, you were here for a Game of Thrones screening. I was here for the last episode of Game of Thrones. Yeah, there was a another awesome event. event that was going on here. Incredible. Yeah. And I fell in love and I said, Linda. How can it's I wonderful. And I said, resume. welcome. I yeah. can use your help. That's great. So the Game of Thrones, um, that event was pretty, pretty great. And uh, I, I mean, Halloween costumes this year are all about Game of Thrones. Truly. And, it is true. Yeah. We were very fortunate. HBO and Xfinity contacted us and wanted to do a, a streaming of the first episode of the last season. And so they came in and set up this grand, wonderful uh, setting in the Great Hall. Mm -hmm. um, hundreds and hundreds of candles and did a production that night as they streamed in that, that Wow. First step oh, that is awesome. Do you get great. a lot of requests like that for film and TV? We do. We're yeah. actually getting more and more. Um, and actually, we're trying to do at least one or two a year, um, hopefully more in yeah. our future. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful revenue for the castle as well. That's mm -hmm. awesome. So Halls of Darkness finishes up this weekend. Yeah. And then what do we have going on yeah. here at the Mary. museum? So What's next happening? week, we have a trick-or-treat program for oh, children. Right. Yeah. On yeah. the Wednesday the 30th, we're welcoming all the kids on Cape Ann to come from between 3 and 5 for trick-or-treating pumpkin date decorating warm cider yeah. so i think it'll be really nice is this oh, the first year that that's happened tricks or treats yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's, that's a really great cool. thing to have yeah we're excited you know, about again it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're engaging children here. What engaging, a fabulous thing. Reaching out to the community yeah. to let them all know that we're here and we want to be part of, the, the, mm -hmm. of them. So. Right. Mm -hmm. and we, uh, there's another big program as we get towards Christmas time yeah, as so well. Yeah, so you're usually closed during the, mm -hmm. um, during the winter season. So, and we are, it's coming on, right? Winter's yes. coming. <laughs> it's coming. So we, it's the first time in over a decade that we'll be open to the community. Yes. Mm -hmm. We're going to be decking the halls. We've invited a bunch of local communities, that, organizations to come in and pick a room and decorate a tree. Oh, right. <gasps> That's yeah. wonderful. So, um, and then we're going to have a craft fair on December 7th. We have a bunch of different vendors who will be coming in from throughout Cape Ann, all different types of um, goodies available at that. And then what else do we have going on? Well, the great thing is about <laughs> events like that is obviously everything can, can be contained indoors. Mm -hmm. Summertime, right. of course, you can spill yeah. outside. Uh, and the parking is awesome here, too. It's, right. it's easier than you think to park over Magnolia. I mean, the lot is awesome. There's no metered parking over here. Yeah, that's right. can, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, that's, a, that's the big secret. So can you tell me the dates again for the special holiday um, yep. tour of the different rooms? Yep. Our Deck the Halls is actually going to start on Saturday the 7th of December. Um, the rooms will be decorated and there are a number of local um, floors that are partaking in that. All volunteer. Um, they come in and they're taking a room on. Audrey's Flowers is going to be helping us. Um, All Purpose Flowers, which is in yeah, Linda, love Linda, 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 Linda yep. Brown, she's fantastic. Um, Chapman's Greenhouse is going to be here yes. doing. Anasquam Landscaping uh, is going to do actually our courtyard, which I'm so excited to see. That's great. Yeah, and, um, yeah. that's going to be beautiful. So we're still looking for one or two more, actually. Um, and oh, actually, the Girl Scout troop, the Brownie troop yeah. in Manchester, is coming in to do our dining room. Oh, oh that's cool. wonderful. Um, that should be really fun. What a great community yeah. event. It is. If yeah. people are interested in participating, how should they go about contacting Just, you? you can, they can contact me or Mary, actually. Um, L. Harvey at HammondCastle.org, um, and we're, we do have several more rooms that we'd like to, to have someone volunteer to fix mm -hmm. and do up, yeah. um, but all the rooms will be done um, no matter if we have more volunteers or not. Uh, the castle is going to be taking care of making sure that every room looks gorgeous. And oh, that's is. something to look forward to. Lovely. Yeah, this is great. great. A lot of exciting stuff going I on. I know. Well, thank so you, Mary Goldberg and Linda sure. Harvey, for coming back on. It's wonderful to have you 
here on Now We're Here. And um, we'll look forward to hearing more about Great. this. Something else I would love to mention sure. is that um, on the 7th, we're actually having, we've invited the um, This Gloucester. is November 7th or no, December? December, December, this December. This is our December, December program. Because yeah. we have, every weekend we are jam-packed with things that are going to be happening. Right. So, but on the 7th, the um, Gloucester High School Drama Department is going to come in and they're going to be doing a play called It's a Wonderful Life, the radio production. Oh. And so we're so thrilled to be able to have this, these young students here mm -hmm. to do that and the proceeds mm -hmm. of that evening will be shared with them so that um, it's a benefit to the to Oh, that's so great. So is it the same the day as the craft fair? So you have the <clears throat> craft fair during the day and then this thing at night? No, or no. Is... Craft, oh. craft fair is on, on Saturday, the 7th. Um, okay. The play is on the 8th. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the following, um, on the 13th of December and the 20, and the 15th of December, um, we are opening Santa Claus is Coming to the Castle. Right. Um, I've heard about this. We, it's a sellout, unfortunately. I, there are no tickets still available, but we'll be entertaining over 140 children, giving them gifts um, from Santa That's to great. share the Christmas yeah. spirit as well. well and then we have so. a day of Renaissance music mm -hmm. on yes. December um, 14th. The 14th, that's right, in the afternoon. And then in the evening on the 15th, we have Chelsea Berry concert. She's offering a holiday concert. Great here. foreshadowing, Mary. Mm -hmm. I know. I know. Uh, yeah. We wonder who's on next. Yeah. <laughs> I don't figure that out. Um, and then the Real Cool Cats, we have a jazz concert yes. here on December 15th. Mm -hmm. Tickets are all available online. Just log on to our website, hamcastle.org, um, and get your tickets in the event calendar. There you go. That's great. Well, thanks again well for being put. on. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. See, that was just so bad, Mary, right? Yeah. <laughs> see? That's right. wonderful. Wonderful to oh. see you both. So thank, thank you. you. Linda thanks. Harvey and Mary Goldberg from Hamlin Castle Museum talking about all the amazing events that are starting. Uh, I mean, they've been coming off a great season, but right through the holiday season, there's almost something going on every single day and certainly every weekend. So uh, that was cool to share that with you. And now we have a very special guest joining very us today. Very special guest. Maureen. I know. Chelsea Berry is here. Chelsea, come on. Can you believe this? Hi, Hi Chelsea. So great to see you. <laughs> Hi, it's good to see you. So we're talking about amazing events that are going to be happening here at the castle, and you have a very special event to share I with everyone. Do. I'm so excited. So um, Mary asked me uh, this summer if we could do a show, and we decided to do a Christmas show at the castle. So it's the 14th of December, and I think we have about 100 seats, and there are 70 left. So we're hopefully going to sell this. I don't think that's going to be an issue. Yeah, that, you think, you think you're going to be set up right here in the in the dining room? We are, hall? yeah. We'll because the acoustics be, in this in this amazing. room are amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I first walked in here with her this summer, you know, I walked in and went, "Oh man, this is cool." <laughs> so is, was that your first uh, trip to the castle? Yes. Your first visit, yeah. yeah. Amazing, right? Yeah. So what's going on in Chelsea land these days? Oh my gosh. Come on. Well, yeah, give us the, the down home. Do you scoop. want me to tell you what I've been talking about with my therapist? <laughs> <laughs> well, well. You'd be surprised how often that happens. I, like, <laughs> yeah. um, actually, the most exciting sort of recent ongoing project is that I'm recording an album in Denver right now, just outside of Denver, mm -hmm. with a girlfriend of mine that I've toured with and written some songs with. And so I'm kind of commuting back and forth and trying to get a little hiking in. And Corey and I were discussing earlier that it's different hiking at 14,000 feet. Hiking, yeah. drinking, anything. Drinking, <laughs> yeah, doing any breathing, yeah. existing, yeah. you know. So yeah, why Denver to begin with? So my girlfriend, Megan Burt, mm -hmm. is who I'm recording with, and she was born and raised in Denver, and she splits her time between there and the East Coast. Uh -huh. And so she's producing along with her boyfriend, and he has a studio there, and so, um, it just kind of, I was kind of in a rut. It's been a, a interesting couple years for me and um, and I really needed a little fire under my butt. And Megan said, why don't you come out here and let's make records. So she and I co-wrote a lot of the songs together. And, hmm. Yeah. What are you expecting to finish that? I'm hoping it will be done by May, I'm sorry, by March and then maybe released in May. Oh wow, awesome. So tell us a little bit about your, your writing process when you sure. write songs. How did they come to you? Every Every musician has a different way mm -hmm. and, and tell us about yours um well my favorite place to sort of incubate songs is outside so hiking skiing kayaking you know um, and what i've actually found most recently my writing process is always changing but the best thing for me to do is to wake up in the morning make a cup of coffee not look at my phone don't check facebook don't look at especially not the news that just draws every ounce of creative energy out of me mm. And so I just sit down and I'm quiet for a little bit and start writing. And sometimes you get a whole song out in the morning and sometimes you just get a bunch of random ideas. But 
that seems to be my new time before the day gets crazy and yeah it's a good yeah. it's before both halves of your brain can conspire to work against you exactly <laughs> that's how, that's how I, I like thought that. when I had to write I it was like, like yeah. as soon as I wake up just go if I sit here and think about it or, or do the night owl mm -hmm. thing there's nothing mm -hmm. I know a lot out. of people are creative at night it blows they, my mind yeah. you know they yeah. have a drink and they get creative yeah, if right. I have a drink I get distracted uh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> among other things right, right? Yeah. so you start with the you start writing first um, are you playing or does that come later so um, I've actually had this conversation with people a lot recently that I used to always sort of, it's almost like you'd be writing a poem and then you'd sit down with the guitar or at the piano and kind of put, put it to music. Mm -hmm. And now I hear, even if I'm not playing it or singing it, I'm hearing the melody in my head and the chords in my head. Um, I guess just because I've gotten to a point where I'm comfortable enough on my instruments that I don't have to sort of translated, it just happens. It's happening. And so if I'm in a place where I, usually you have your phone with you and you can record it, but if I, if I don't, I write it out in solfege. So you remember, um, do a deer, a female deer, right, right yeah. from mm -hmm. uh, Town of Music, mm -hmm. one of my favorite movies. Ever. I love that movie too. <laughs> so that's actually, a, it's a system, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, and I'll write down the lyrics with the corresponding notes wow. next to it. Uh -huh rather than writing out music, which mm -hmm. takes a million mm -hmm. years. And um, so, how yeah. did How did this all begin for you? As a child? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you have a great story. You have a great story. Well, I have these really fun tapes of my mom and I singing when I was three, you know, and so they always encouraged that. And they bought me a little tape recorder, play school, you know, when I was probably two or three years old. And then I graduated to a, a little bit bigger one and then the karaoke machine and then the computer with the recording stuff with it. And, um, and so I always, I always loved to sing to the point, I mean, I would get in trouble for singing with my mouth full of food at the dinner table. Mm -hmm. Like Chelsea, please don't sing with your mouth full at the dinner table, that kind of thing. Yeah. So mom and dad put me in a, uh, the Anchorage Children's Choir when I was five. Uh -huh. And then- That's Anchorage, Alaska. Anchorage, Alaska. For folks Alaska. who don't know, that's yes. where Chelsea grew right. up. Yeah. <laughs> so they just really, they invested in that. They saw mm -hmm. that it was something that I was excited about as a kid and they just have always supported that. Yeah. yeah, music is such, um, it's a language, um, it's, it's part of, I think, every child's experience, or mm -hmm. can be and should be, and so um, you never know what's going to happen with a musical education. And how often right? do you hear a song now, and all of a sudden you are back to... Oh, so important. When you were six and you were in New Hampshire with your parents and they right. took you on that camping trip and, you know, it's like a smell or a taste that yeah. brings you back there in time. What about with your songs? You've got so many fans mm -hmm. um, and you've been on tour all over the country and the world, right? I mean, you've done... Well, I haven't... Done I've done tour? the world, but the world was with a choir. I haven't done the world as, right. as Chelsea, Chelsea Berry, Berry, but I'm working on it. That's great. So <laughs> really um, your to. fans, do they have that special moment with you in your songs? Which which like special your moment? fans have you? Oh, do they when come they come up to back you and say, "Hey, you know this song, mm -hmm. it just brings me right back." Or you know, we had the song at our you know special event. So actually, event, I played a show in New York City at the Cutting Room, which is this really cool venue um, in Midtown, and uh, this woman came up. This was last April, I think, and this woman came up to me, and I swear I hadn't ever seen her before, but but I. I said, thank you so much for coming to the show. And she said, I saw you in Nashville at the Bluebird Cafe when you were 24 years old. And I love your music so much. Ago. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm 36. <laughs> so that was, but that was when I was really just starting out. I just finished at Berkeley and was kind of trying to, I was landscaping in Nashville for a job mm -hmm. and working at REI and riding my bike to work every day and playing music at night. And she started spouting off these songs that I haven't played since then. How I awesome forgot I'd even that? written. She was, and she was just telling me about how important they were to her and how much they meant to her and how great it was for her to be in New York and see me playing at a big venue for, you know, more money, obviously, and, right, right. <laughs> and really doing it. So it's, it's really cool mm -hmm. to, um, to have people come back in. And especially if it's in a geographical, you know, mix up. I'll see people in Ohio that I know I recognize them, but I can't put a face and a name together. And they go, well, the thing is we live in Florida, but we were here visiting and we saw that you were playing. And so. we might as well just come oh, and see cool you. Yeah, that? that's great. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's great. So. Well, well, Maureen, we're pretty lucky today too. I know. Chelsea has um, accepted to perform. 
Are you going to come back and do that for us, or are you going to do that right now for no, let's us? No, let's do, let's do something do now. Okay, great. I'll come back to Chelsea again. Great. Yeah. Well, I do have my guitar right here. Let's go. So, let's go. It just so happens. It just, oh, look at that. Isn't that convenient? Um, so I was thinking about what to play for you, and this is a song that's on the new album. And the only reason, not the only reason, but the reason I'm playing it for you is, you know, we're talking about Halloween, and we're surrounded by, by the way, a bunch of super awesome and really creepy stuff. For in real. This house. Yes. And this guy, yeah. like, I, I don't want to be here at night. I'm glad <laughs> other people do. That'll be fun for you guys, but not me. Um, but this song is, uh, it's called Monsters and Machines. And so it really has nothing to do with Halloween, except for that. That's all. It works for us. <laughs> okay. Now for your Facebook debut. That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I hear the traffic early in the morning Reminds me there's people around Heading down the highway, praying for promotion And hoping that the walls will come down And they wonder, what am I driving for? I might as well be a machine This is not the dream I dream Crawling down the freeway, one after another. This half hour drive takes two. But it's in the job description. The mind is disassembling on factory coffee and talk radio. And they wonder, what am I driving for? I might as well be a machine running on fake news and caffeine. And they wonder, what am I working for? Was it always in the plan? Is it the destiny of man? Are we part of a picture and part of each other? Mothers and cousins and fathers and friends, children and brothers. Are we all puzzle pieces, our place to discover? Or are we just surviving one another? We can be so reckless, fickle and contentious, angry and cruel and unkind. Instead of loving neighbors, we build up walls between us, victims of each other and the grind. I'm not sure that's what God had in mind. Does he wonder, what am I working for? They just don't seem to understand. This was never in the plan, and I had hoped for so much more. But these monsters and machines, this is not the dream I dreamed. Chelsea, very gorgeous. Beautiful songwriting, Chelsea. Just that beautiful awesome. songwriting. Oh my God. It makes me want to cry. Yeah. Oh, no no don't crying. Cry. There's no crying don't on set. Cry. <laughs> the idea is is not necessarily to cry, but you know, it's something I'm trying to really work on with this record is to remind myself and to remind the people that are listening that we have to take care of each other. Yeah, we do. Don't we really we? do. Yeah, it's especially these said. days. Yeah. Yeah, we're not we're not doing a great job. So, reach out when you can. Reach yeah. out to folks you haven't talked to in a while. Mm -hmm. You know, care for each other. Shower the people you love with love. That's right. Et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> yeah, love it, Chelsea. Yeah. So we want to say December fourteenth. December fourteenth. Right. Doors at six thirty. Show at seven. Yeah. Cash bar. Yeah, like, how, how can I people mean, get tickets? Uh, people can get tickets on my website, okay. chelseaberry.com. They can go to Hammond Castle's website. Yeah, HammondCastle.org. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and. Facebook and you know this is easy yeah, yeah. it's easy, it's easy enough. enough it's easy enough uh, yeah well thank we'll you have so you back much. in a little bit yeah yes. all right thank you so much for oh having my gosh, me sure so oh it's awesome. a super thank pleasure you. thanks that's great
Woo. Chelsea Berry, everybody. What a show, Maureen. I know, little debut, yay. Um, okay, so our next guest is Charles Nazarian. Yes, we love Charles. We love Charles. Charles, come on. Charles, you get to follow Chelsea Berry. I know, sorry. <laughs> That's a tough act. Yeah, I, I, I know, and I know you've been waiting, and so I so no appreciate problem. you being waiting. How are you? Good, it's great, great to, to see you, Corey. Again. As hey, always, Maureen. thank you, Charles. Nice to see great you. Great to see you. Yeah. Welcome. So, Charles, you are... Um, We've talked because we I interviewed you for the podcast, Backcast Capan, mm -hmm. and we had this incredible conversation about John Hayes Hammond and also Sleeper and Pyatt and Andrew, A. Pyatt Andrew, mm -hmm. and, um, and you just have so much history and that's why we want to engage you right now. Can you okay. take us through some information on Hammond and, you know, like the... Um, the the background in the gay community and mm -hmm. also the cult information, mm -hmm. his yes. sister, like, can you do all that in about seven minutes? <laughs> I think so, I think so. <laughs> we spent an hour talking. Yeah. <laughs> well, we can only touch the high points. So touch them first. But uh, I think one of the things that I have to say is just an opener is that it's always dangerous to talk about historical people who, with modern terms. So uh, when we talk about somebody who might be gay today, that term didn't exist back in those days. Right. Mm. And um, in the case of John Hayes Hammond, he was married, very devoted to his wife, Irene. Letters between them, we know, were uh, copious and very warm. Uh, but there were uh, many people in his circle uh, who we are quite sure would identify as gay if that word had existed at the time. Um, Henry Davis Sleeper is certainly one of them, and A. Pyatt Andrew. A. Pyatt Andrew uh, came into my consciousness, aside from driving over the 128 Bridge, right. when I first moved here in 1975 to work for Charles Fisk, the organ builder whose shop is only about a mile away. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a opening for somebody to play a Sunday service at the Universalist Church which has a nice pipe organ from the 1890s, and I accepted. I uh, prepared a Bach prelude and fugue, and I got myself all ready to go, and I met the choir only that morning. And before I was about to go up and play my Bach prelude, a tenor in the choir said, oh, well, I'd like to tell you some stories about my uncle, A. Pyatt Andrew. He was a gay blade. Wow. And he launched into these stories about how the young Franklin Delano Roosevelt was a, a young visitor there and how there was a pipe organ and a playroom. And I barely made it up the stairs to play my Bach prelude. That was one of the inklings I had that a lot of really interesting stuff had gone on here in Gloucester. Hmm. Uh, I think in that same year, that first year I was here, I had read some things about Jack Hammond. And one of them was that there was a Ming tomb in which he was buried here on the property. And at the time, the property was pretty much wide open uh, to the south of us. There are now a couple of large houses there. So I wandered around and I came upon a, sort of a promontory and I didn't really realize where I was, and there was a path that went around it. So I went around it, and I suddenly realized that I had been standing on the tomb, mm. and that there was this arched oak door with a Ouija board leaning against it. <laughs> really? Yes, really. And I thought, ooh, okay. <laughs> you know, this is pathway. really interesting. Yes, a communication pathway here. I later learned through um, a book that used to be on sale here, and I was talking to the director. It's uh, no longer in print, but it's a, a small paperback volume uh, that the steps that went down from the tomb to the ocean, mm -hmm. well, there was one step for each year of Jack Hammond's life. So somehow he had a premonition of what his lifetime might be. Otherwise, mm -hmm. he couldn't have set the steps into place. Mm -hmm. And uh, that volume uh, sort of filled in a lot of blanks for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I understood that he and Irene both were very interested in the occult, and also they had tons of cats. Um, we would consider them eccentric millionaires today. Mm. Uh, the other thing that put this place and Jack Hammond into my consciousness was an early tour that I took. And in that tour, there was a docent who had been here a very, very long time. And she took us through with an eye towards 
why the things that are here were placed. For example, in one of the guest rooms, there is a cabinet in which there's a hidden place for somebody to sleep on the top of the cabinet. And uh, Jack bought that from a Italian Renaissance villa in which the family was worried about being murdered by um, people coming in. So they would have a servant sleep on top of that piece of furniture to keep an eye out. Amazing. In that same room, she pointed out a keeper where food was kept um, while the servant tasted it first and they waited to see whether or not it was poison. Everywhere we went through the castle, she pointed out things like this, which just completely knocked us out. Uh, one of them was the refractory table here in the dining room, mm -hmm. which if you've had a look at it, is extremely narrow and very long mm -hmm. and doesn't look like anybody's dining room table. Mm -hmm. And she explained that it came from a priory in which the friars uh, were worried about being stabbed by their help. Apparently one of them had been killed. And so they all sat with their back to the wall facing out with this very narrow table so nobody could get behind them. It was just so these pieces very, all very this hard to believe. Story. <laughs> Did they collected things with stories like this. Yes, or? yes. She she was Why able to so? tell those stories. Well, I I don't I really don't know. Um, I think that Jack was particularly interested in things medieval, and obviously castles and that sort of thing, um, but why this particular interest in death and what we would mm -hmm. consider sort of spooky stuff, but serious spooky stuff, mm -hmm. one can't really say. Uh, clearly, it was of great interest to him. So um, then the, uh, the other really kind of interesting thing about um, the, uh, the whole lifestyle here, uh, some of which has been documented in a book by Douglas Shantucci called The Boston Bohemians. And he talks about Cecilia Bow and Isabella Stewart Gardner coming up to Gloucester and visiting with the Hammonds, with Sleeper, and um, with Apai and Andrew. But there was also a fourth man who was part of that group, and that was Leslie Buswell. Leslie Buswell was the same age as Jack Hammond and came to Gloucester. He was an actor from England. And uh, his home, Stillington Hall, is on the other side of the road here and up the hill. Mm -hmm. Many people don't know about it because it's been in private hands. Um, it was rumored that Jack and Leslie Buswell were lovers, but we have no documentation about this. We only have apocryphal stuff. But if you visit Stillington, you will see lots of artifacts that look like they could have been part of the castle but were integrated into Stillington Hall. Mm. And we know that Sleeper helped to design it. And one of its features is a theater, which is as long as the Great Hall, but much wider. And it has changing rooms and set materials yeah. that were all created for an actor. And, um, you know, it was Buswell's home. And, but was Buswell an, an actor? Yes, yeah. he was an actor. Now, he, he married subsequently. In fact, I believe he married several times and had a son. And the family didn't, I think, want anybody to know that there might have been an intimate connection. Um, and so all of that was very hidden. It sort of came out very, very slowly mm -hmm. in the 80s uh, when um, two men from... New York bought Stillington Hall and started opening up for people. You've been it. Have you been in it? Uh, yes. Yeah. I used to it's work a, in there when I was a kid. It's an amazing place. Mm -hmm. Absolutely wow. amazing place to see. And it is in very, very much related to this building. It's mm -hmm. kind of a, a, a sister building to the castle, but in a, in a Tudor uh, style and mm -hmm. different proportions. Mm -hmm. But lots of cut stone, lots of liturgical stuff in it. Very cool stuff. Yeah, and cool stories. Yeah, girls. I know. Yeah. Thanks for yeah. the stories. I yeah. know that's why sure. it's always fascinating sure. to talk with ha you. Happy to. Happy yeah. to. Yeah. That's great. And so, well, the organ here. Yes. Um, it doesn't work, but. Yes, the organ here has a very interesting history. Uh, we know that Jack Hammond was an amazing inventor. And I was lucky that I got to hear this organ in the 70s and 80s when it was still working. And there were a number of organists who I knew who came here to play. Um, Richard L. Sasser was the most famous one, uh, but uh, there were quite a few others who came. 
Uh, even in that period, the organ was not in good repair. But what people don't realize is that because Jack was so into electronics, he didn't uh, just have the organ sound by its pipes. He had two very large voice of the theater speakers hidden behind the curtains, behind the stone arches behind us. Mm. And he would adjust the sound of the organ to his liking so that if somebody was playing a piece by Bach, he would adjust the sound to the way he thought the sounds ought to be. Interesting. And the other piece that goes hand in hand with that is that a lot of the pipe work is hidden up in the tower and it can't possibly get its sound out here into the great hall the way one would like. So he had microphones buried into those high chambers into the tower and he could bring those sounds out at will. So for him, the pipe organ was merged with his Electronic. The original boombox, yeah. Right. In some ways, in some ways. <laughs> yes. And he would bring great players. Uh, the organ console used to be up in this gallery here yeah. before the current console was mm -hmm. brought down to the floor. Mm -hmm. But that was actually a very dramatic spot. That and, is a very dramatic uh, spot to be playing and the organ. That, yeah. that was where he would listen to it from, so yeah. I'm told. Uh, Charles, I think we could have a whole show with you on, for just real? like I had you on sure. the podcast. Okay. It was just a pleasure to have you on. Same Thank here. you so much for coming. Yeah. Treat to be here yeah. in the castle. Yeah. We'll look great, forward Charles. to more stories from Charles okay. and yeah. Anytime you like. Uh, often. Okay. Often. All right. Thank, Thank you, good. Charles, so Bye, much. Charles. Bye bye. All right. We'll see you soon. Wow. So, in speaking of um, occult and all these interesting things for Halloween, um, and also just remember the. Um, other things I mentioned about Celtic origin, and this is this is a time of you know connecting with the thin veil on Halloween. The, the veil is thin; it comes down, and so um, there's this idea that you can have a conversation with ancestors, but we have or spirits, but we have someone coming on, Annette Dion, who really is so well connected with so many so many things and elements. And Annette, and you're a psychic. How do you pre how do you present yourself? You know, you mean, what's do my do title? Yeah. Psychic, or do we? <laughs> um, I'm a psychic spiritual counselor yeah. and tarot card reader. Am I close enough? You are. Can <laughs> okay, so yeah. you all hear me? Yes, close we've got the great I'm acoustics. I'm so in here. excited to be here. Thank you for coming on Thank the show. You, we're so thrilled to have you on. Oh, yeah, Annette and I are old friends. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, not old, but we're friends. We're friends. <laughs> friends for a long time. We should long. say that Annette's also a wonderful musician. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful songwriter and musician. Yeah, I kind of steered more in the direction of um, focusing more on the psychic side of things mm -hmm. um, because I, I, I really want to raise awareness that there's nothing scary about going like bridging the gap between the two worlds. And I really believe that that's why Halloween is just so popular. I do too, I do too. Because it's the only time of the year that people actually en masse acknowledge that there's a spiritual realm. Mm -hmm. and, and connect with death somehow too. Like, I mean, we've got a skull here. Yeah, and, like you know, the day the of the dead. Yeah, the day of the dead and the thin veil and that time on Halloween that people come out and celebrate this. Um, Tell us a little bit more about maybe just bringing some more awareness to this. So what um, I know about Halloween this time of the year, when things are dying, like trees are dying and things are dying, that spiritual energy, that life force energy goes into the air. And the same thing happens to us when we die and cross over. We actually become spiritual beings. And I think that everybody knows this on some level. And that's why, you know, this is such an exciting time of the year for people and they dress up and kind of make it into like, oh, it's Halloween, so we can do this. But we should always be able to do this. And I've always felt that way. And from the time I was very young, I always felt like um, I kind of knew more than other people. And I actually, excuse me, but I thought that people were kind of dumb because <laughs> they didn't know so many things about people and situations that I just picked up on. So what is that like for you when you pick up on something? I mean, it's, it's intuition, it's is it your psychic it's, ability. It's intuition. What, mm -hmm. So what do you feel? Like, what, what kinds of things do you see? What do you feel when you're either, uh, you come into this building, for instance, or you're in someplace else, or you're working with one of your clients? I, um, am, I call myself clairvoyant. Clairvoyant is the ability to sense energy. So if you wanted me to tap into a situation, I could describe what I was feeling with a person or, you know, an event or, you know, whatever is, you know, you ask me about. 
And the, the tarot cards, I didn't bring them with me today. Um, the tarot cards actually work as kind of like a storytelling, um, like looking at the pictures triggers thoughts and ideas, like certain colors, certain emotions, certain figures in the card. Um, I'm actually teaching tarot class now for the first time ever. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so interesting because there are archetypes that that tell our life story, you know, there, there are pictures that will tell you what's going on. Like what? Give us an example like, of, you know, when you're doing a reading, those archetypal uh, cards that come up. Say if I got, say there's a card called the High Priestess, and the High Priestess would indicate, that's part of the major arcana, that would indicate somebody who's very um, strong, strong-willed, and very spiritually aware and connected. And if that card um, was followed by, say, the Nine of Swords, which looks like a person sitting up in bed grieving, then that would mean, that could mean that the person is not recognizing their power because they're all upset over something that's very, you know, sort of carnal and material when they have this access to the divine because they have the high priestess archetype. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's so empowering to get a reading because the way that I do a reading, I point out the strengths. You know, and the possibilities and the opportunities and the magic. I've had readings, several readings with you, Annette. And I told you you'd be very successful, you as I recall. It. And <laughs> yes. I have Seriously I've did. also had readings oh, with you. Oh, I, and I don't yeah. remember. I've That's done okay. thousands of readings. I know, you've but done I hope so it was much. Good. That was great, actually. Did you see really this? Could you me. foresee this happening? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I'm thrilled about this. Yeah. <laughs> really thrilled about this. Um, I, you know, I just have to say that I grew up in Gloucester. When I was um, young, we'd go out to where John Hammond was buried, his tomb, uh, out on a full moon night and hear the bell at Norman's Woe. And it was pretty spooky, but mm -hmm. it was fun too. Yeah. <laughs> Loved that. Yeah. So what sort of energy do you pick up on when you, were in, when you visit the castle? Today? Well, the reason I didn't bring my cards today was because I was more interested in doing a reading on the castle. Yeah. This is one of my very favorite places in the whole wide world. Um, I did a psychic fair here several years back, and I had a table set up right there, right over in, you know, in where all the cameras that. are. Yeah. And um, every reading I did, you know, I definitely felt John Hammond's presence. Every reading I did, the, the full card kept coming up to the point where it was like silly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just, after a while, I was like, he's playing with me. He's because he's, the full is the jester and, you know, fun loving, you know, energy. And, and whenever I come here, I pick up on that he loves the attention. He loves when someone comes in and is aware of him, because he I feel like he and I have that whimsical nature in, in common. Mm -hmm. And he was very into spiritualism, which I've been into my whole entire life. Very intrigued by that. And, and, the, and actually, he's given me messages today. One is that he's so excited to have this publicity. He, he must have been a Leo. Oh. Because he loved, Cheers, Jack. he loved the stage, <laughs> yep. you know. He loves sure. attention. Uh, I really get that strongly. I really get strongly um, that he's sending the message that he's thrilled about educational um, opportunities here. Uh, kids coming in and um, learning about engineering and inspiring them to be inventors mm. and to be creative. And also he's saying that there's a treasure trove, and I don't usually use those kind of words, so he's saying there's a treasure trove of things in this castle that you haven't even scratched the surface. Mm. Like every single artifact here has a huge story. And he would love for people to get more into what everything means. We have to crack the whip on Scott Cordner and, and, and the Linda history. Harvey. Linda, did you hear yeah, that? Start he digging loves Linda. Linda. Yeah, start digging. I, I want to tell you, he loves Linda Harvey. Yeah. I think he sent you here. <laughs> I do. <That's> possible. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the other night I came to an event and there was, I, I, you know, I was flying solo. I came to a fundraiser. It was a tastings, the wine tastings. And I walked in and I was like, oh gosh, I don't really know anyone here, but, but I know John Hammond. So I walk into the library and I literally was like telepathically communicating with him. I said, John, you know, help me out here. I don't know anybody. I need someone to talk to. Not five minutes had passed. A woman walked in, total stranger, started talking to me about psychic phenomena. And we, we hit it off. We had this great conversation. And that was just like him, oh, here's somebody. <laughs> right. Right. So Don't he was that? like that, too. You know, he had yeah. parties and he was like, Meet so and so. Meet so and so. Yeah, I mean, I I don't believe in coincidences really. I think things just come together. 
um, for the reason why you're supposed to have them and also these signs that you get. I, I'm constantly getting different signs that helps me to understand, you know, what I'm feeling or where I'm at. Um, right. And I feel like that's something to be embraced. Um, Yes, definitely. What do you think about, you know, this is growing a trend of, not so much a trend, but more of like an embrace of spirituality, not so much religion, but um, this embrace of spirituality, this acceptance of, you know, going to get your cards read um, and engaging in these uh, ways of getting more information. Well, it's, it's always been there. It's, it's, always, it's always been, been there. there. Yeah. What happened was it got covered up by technology and progress. Mm -hmm the Industrial Revolution, but back, you know, thousands of years ago, people, were, that's what people did. People did divination. It's not like it lost its potency. It never lost its potency. I, from a very young age, felt like this is where it's at, just like with music. I always felt from a very young age, this is it. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. if you don't have yourself immersed in, in that in some small or large way, you're, you're really missing out on the magic of life because Life really is magical and life really is mystical. And when you have that, that aspect, those, you know, that sort of a, a feeling to go to and to practice, like through music or meditation practice or the cards, the mediumship, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. If you don't have that, then what do you have? Really not much, uh, you know, from my perspective, maybe not everybody feels that way. It's nice to have a balance of the material, you know, and the, the spiritual. Mm -hmm. And I like to say I, I live in both wor worlds. And when I really get, like everyone else, stressed out, full of an anxiety and fear and craziness, I know what to do. Sit and play the piano, play the guitar, mm -hmm. sing, meditate, do a reading, cross over somehow, mm -hmm. you know, touch mm -hmm. that other realm. And that's what people are craving so, so much. And I just want to mention, too, the number one thing that I hear um, from people that are reluctant to get readings, and I've heard it so, so many times, is I'm afraid to get a reading. I'm scared. I'm scared of what you might say. I don't think you said that. No, I was <laughs> like... He's pretty brave. Bring we it did, on. We did a live before you could go live. We're like, well, let her rip. <laughs> yeah. But, um, and I mean, my response to that is why? It's your life. You know, it's... Don't you want to know more? Like getting your astrology chart read, for example, that's mm. like a blueprint of your life and your soul. I do read past lives too. So it's wonderful to find out more about your past lives, which comes to me in a reading like kind of like a mini movie. I just catch a scene, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much time I have, but I could tell a quick story. Yeah, sure, tell a quick there, story. I did a reading for a woman one time, and this is just one of many examples where I saw her like as a kind of a soldier on a horse, like a knight, and she was in battle in this lifetime, and she got side, like rammed by this other horse and soldier and fell off her horse, and that's how she died. So as soon as I said that, she said, oh, well, just a couple weeks ago, I was in my car, and I got sideswiped, and the car you know, hit so hard, and I'm lucky I didn't get killed. And, so we have like, I call them energetic blueprints. Mm. And we have tendencies to go, you know, in the direction that's similar to something that happened in a past life. And we have, um, we come back into this lifetime to resolve issues around like say three to six past lifetimes because we have really hundreds. And to either resolve issues with people or situations or um, to continue doing something we enjoyed. Mm -hmm. I'm very clear that I was a gypsy tarot card reader in a past life <laughs> who traveled what with the circus. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I think I'm here to, to be more more legit, to sort of legitimize this this type of thing. You know, like, so I set up an office on Main Street in Gloucester. I'm upstairs from Sugar Magnolias, anybody from Gloucester or Rockport that's listening, or Cape Ann. And, um, and so now I do spiritual counseling, and I'm really, I have a voracious appetite for human potential what's possible and lots, lots and lots of information about that too. So I am really making an effort to, to bridge the gap and make it more like practical spirituality. That's Very great. Cool, well, Annette that. Dion, thank you so thank much. You. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, thank that you, was John so Hammond. Great. I know. <laughs> we'll Thanks. be back. Support the castle. <laughs> Trick or treating on um, Wednesday night, I yeah. think, right? That's right. Yeah. 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 I'll be here. Thank you, Annette. <laughs> thank you. Bye, Annette. Thanks for your time. Okay. So just a quick rundown on some Halloween things that are coming up this week yeah, and for next Chelsea week. Barrier, yeah. yeah, then we're going to bring Chelsea back. Um, so. 
The Gloucester High School Drama Club is having a Halloween carnival tomorrow for little kids now. Little kids, this is 1 to 3 p.m. in their cafeteria. Uh, and then you, you found this trick-or-treating at the Gloucester Wind Turbines is yeah, happening. Yeah, so it's a truck and treat program. It's going to happen up at the turbines. Um, there's going to be electric cars up there um, and kids' activities and food October 26th from 10 to 1. Yeah, Sunday at City Hall in Gloucester, they have their big Halloween festival. Yeah. That's from 2 to 4 p.m. You know the whole deal there. They get crazy with that haunted house. That's right. Hey, That's ride, a wonderful et cetera, program. Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yep. it's a great thing. And then trick or treat at Hammond Castle right here here. again, just as a reminder, October 30th from 3 to 5, right here at the castle. A fun thing. Halloween night, downtown Gloucester trick or treat from 4 to 6 p.m. right up and down Main Street. And we can't forget the senior Halloween party on October 31st on Halloween at Rose Baker Senior Center. That's from 11:30 to 1. Reservations are um, suggested for that. Yeah, and the Halloween Monster Bash of the Cape and YMCA is on November 1st, which I think is the actual day of the right. dead there. Too. And right. Rockport, we have to talk about the Boy Scouts Haunted oh, Hayride. This is great. So That's every year the Cub Scouts do a Haunted Hayride at the top of Summit Ave. And this year it's going to be on Saturday. Uh, October 26th, that's tomorrow from 6 to 9 p.m. A wonderful thing to bring the kids to. I think it's $5. Yep. Um, Essex on Monday, they're going to have a Crafternoon. Halloween Crafting at the Burnham Public Library for yeah. kids age five and up. So you can stop in there for that. That's three to five p.m. on Monday, uh, and then a not so scary Halloween party as uh, I think Janine Mack performs, and they have um, all kinds of trick or treating, jack o' lantern decorations, et cetera, et cetera, going on. That's Wednesday morning from ten to eleven, and that's for the little ones too, two to six years old. And just a couple of things, yeah, just a couple of things outside of Cape Ann that seem really wonderful. Um, Ipswich is Appleton Farms, which is such a beautiful thing. Um, a pumpkin trail. It's tonight. Friday, October 25th. It's from 5:30 to 8:30. Bring the kids. Just walk in Appleton Farms. It's um, you know, candlelight pumpkins. It's it's going to be a great event. And also. Are we close to Salem, the Halloween capital of the world? We are. <laughs> um, if you want to find out what's happening in Salem, Haunted Happenings, you can go to hauntedhappenings.org. We wish Salem all the best. I was in Salem last night. The traffic was crazy. People were in costume, and that was a Thursday night. <laughs> yeah, so it it's really October happening. Either no, it's Salem. a whole it's a whole month celebration for Salem. Yeah. And then of course the halls of darkness right here at Hammond Castle tonight and tomorrow night. You can park right over at Stage Four Park. Right, and just a couple of others that I wanted to bring in sure. here. A Halloween party at the dog park. That's in that's in. Um, that's in Gloucester here. That's uh, Saturday from nine to eleven a.m. Corey and I really wanted to have like a doggy parade with the doggies in costume. We were this close to doing that. I mean, today. really, like, don't you want to see that? I want to see that. Um, and the two faces of Frankenstein that is presented by the Gloucester Meeting House, and uh, that's with um, Peter Kaczynski. Uh, it's going to be he's going to be playing the organ, mm. and um, and there will also be two movies that night, the two faces of Frankenstein. So we just wanted to let you know about that. Lots there of things go. happening on Halloween, and we'd like to bring. Chelsea back just for yeah. one more. Chelsea, you come on and while you're getting set up, we want to thank today's guests, Scott Cordner, Linda Harvey, uh, Dr. Hannibal Lecter, played by John Pettibone, Shannon Murphy yeah. Thornley, Mary Goldberg, Charles Nazarian, Annette Dion, uh, and of course, Chelsea. And we have to thank our crew, right, Becky like Tober, to thank, Matt yep. Mcmakin, yeah, Lisa okay. Smith, Alana Horn, David Lufkin, and we want to thank those who couldn't make it today, Don Epstein and Maya Gerard. Right. So, Chelsea, take it away. Yes, I am. Halloween, people dressing up, being crazy, getting to do what they want to do without consequence because they have a mask on, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> True. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. I have lived my life somewhere between brave and crazy. But I've got no one to save And no one here to save me Walking the wire is my desire My mother in me And I don't know any other way to be I was born a dreamer Optimistic to a fault Never heeding warnings From those who had been there and done that And had it all figured out Paying a price even though the advice Came to me for free But I don't know any other way to be Do, 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 do.
Does it surprise you, baby? No one has ever loved me for myself. Always tried to change me, rearrange me into someone else. Do 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 someone else. Do 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 do. me like a queen and you'll hold me like a lover I wanna give you everything there's no doubt in this baby you'll bring out the best in me and love me for who I am and who I wanna be I wanna make you feel Album early yeah. to 2020. 2020. Thanks yeah. so much. Thank Do this thank again you. with us sometime. I yeah, we'd love will. to have you back that's on, awesome. of course. Anytime. Perfect. All right, we want to thank everyone here at Hammond Castle who made this possible. Come to see the Halls of Darkness and all the other programs they have going on throughout the holidays. That's right. That's it for now. We're here. And thanks, Corey. Thank you, Maureen. All right. We'll, we'll see, see you next time. time. We said that at the same time. I know. <laughs> <laughs> there you go.